Well, it's 10 o'clock in the UK. It's time to start the first of our two Learning and Skills Group webinars today. This is Don Taylor speaking from the Learning and Skills Group. I'm your moderator today, and we have with us, of course, also Charles Gould of Brightwave, who will be talking today, taking us through how to make corporate learning personal. In fact, the title has changed, but that's the title we started off with. The context and the content is the same. It's about Charles will be talking about something I first learned about from Brightwave just before the summer, an event they ran in Scotland. And I have to say, it really chimed with one of the issues I've got around the move towards a more fractured mode of learning where we have resources rather than courses. And what on earth do we do about that if we're delivering corporate learning? Well, I won't try to steal Charles's thumb, not that I could. Uh, I'll leave it to him to, to deliver on what actually that means and go into into that in more detail. First, though, let me, as always, take you through some housekeeping so that, um, <laughs> sorry, I can see we've got a, a slight uh, spat going on about Essex in the chat area. Um, I'll go through some housekeeping, as always. There are always new people on the call. And of course, we are trying uh, a new uh, tool today, Adobe Connect, rather than WebEx, which we've used for a few years. And so probably everyone needs to listen in, although actually the format will be the same. It will be slides, presentation, and lots of chat. Let's get through the housekeeping, then we can move on to Charles. First off, very importantly, a thank you to our sponsors who make all these webinars possible, all 16 of them. There we are on Brightwave, of course, in the pole position in the top left-hand corner. Thanks to them and to all of our sponsors for making the LSG webinar series possible. The question which we're always asked is, will there be the slides available afterwards? The answer is yes, the slides the recording, the chat will all be available afterwards at learningandskillsgroup.com. It is a member organization, but it's free and there's nothing to jump through. You just have to sign up, uh, as you can see on the right-hand side there, click on the sign up button if you're not a member, and you can join the 5,000 people who are already members. Sound will come through a headset. Uh, or through your computer speakers. If there's an issue with that, if you can't do it for some reason, then we've got dial-in details. And as always, I will drop those dial-in details into the text chat area if uh, you need them during the course of the presentation. Uh, and there we are. We've got um, the chat. The chat's very simple. <laughs> Clearly, everyone knows how to do it without any training at all. It's entirely uh, obvious, isn't it? You type your answer where it says type your answer here, and you hit the button, and, and you're off and running. Okay. That's very straightforward, isn't it? If only all of training in life was that simple. If you're enjoying what you're seeing and you like what Charles Gould of Brightwave is saying, then please do let the world know about it on Twitter. That's the hashtag, hash LSG webinar. That's probably enough for me. Now, if there is a bit of background noise here, I can hear some, some other voices in the background. So if it's an open plan office you're listening on, then please do mute your phone um, if, if that's, uh, if, sorry, mute it so we can't hear it if you're dialing in. But it shouldn't be coming through, but it might be. So please, uh, if you are dialing in, then mute your phone. That's enough from me, I think. Time to move over to our speaker today, Charles Gould of Brightwave, who's going to talk us through not the rather waffly title I gave earlier, but a far punchier one, which is Next Generation <laughs> E-Learning. From Charles Gould, Managing Director of Brightwave, and Alex Reeve, our Blended Learning Consultant. <laughs> blended Learning Consultant at Brightwave. Charles and Alex, over to you. Good morning. Thanks, Don. Um, great to see so many people uh, joining. I think we're over the, we're up to the 130 mark, which is considerably more than uh, I had listening to me yesterday at the World of Learning conference. So uh, well done to uh, the LSG to get so many people interested in, the, in, in this webinar. Um, so, yes, I'm Charles Gould, I'm Managing Director of Brightwave, and I'm joined by um, a colleague of mine, Alex Reeve. And as Don says, I'm sorry, go, go ahead and say hello. Alex. Hello, everyone. Alex here. So, yes, as Don said, we've adapted the, the title a little bit, although it will certainly cover um, many of the things that, that uh, were billed. And it's a, perhaps a somewhat grand title, Next Generation E-Learning, a uh, fairly bold uh, uh, way of starting off the, uh, the presentation. But we're nothing if not forward-thinking here at Brightwave. Um, and uh, in all seriousness, there are, are, I think, some very important uh, trends and issues that I would like to raise with you, uh, discuss, 
and then lead into some examples. So if I just um, be quick, oops, I did have an agenda there. Wasn't it? <laughs> it was going to be an agenda. I don't know where that slide slipped off to, but um, yeah, over the next uh, 45 to 60 minutes we'll be talking through some of the things that we see happening um, in, 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 our, in our work, some of the trends that are, that are going on and influencing not just the work that we're doing now, but uh, the way that we provide um, our services to our clients in the future. And we'll be touching on three or four case studies from companies such as uh, BP, uh, Booper, uh, Lloyd's Banking Group, Sky, and then a little bit more depth uh, around uh, some work that we've been doing with Heineken recently. So let me just start, and I'll throw open uh, a question to everybody here. And, and perhaps if you could type your thoughts and, uh, uh, in response to this question into the, into the chat box. What are some of the common objections that you or other people typically have to conventional e-learning courses? So we've got yeah, boring, lack of engagement, uh, <laughs> inaccessible, <laughs> poor user experience, not personalized, dull, too linear. That's a good one. Yeah, boring seems to be coming up quite a lot. Uh, gosh, plenty of... Plenty of uh, I, I like Andrew Hyde's alleged lack of interactivity. I think that, that covers, in four words, a lot of the response people have to uh, e-learning. Yeah, I think that's not a bad way of putting it, because, of course, um, you can get very well-designed e-learning that meets a particular purpose, um, even if it is relatively uh, linear. But I think what, what we do see all too often is, yeah, a lot of the things that have been mentioned, that, that uh, mental e-learning is... is boring, it can be irrelevant and too long, uh, it can force people through things that perhaps they already know or just don't seem to be um, of, any, of any use to them, it can be inaccessible, and uh, yeah, dull, perhaps because it's, it's frozen in time, it, it's, it's, uh, it's too, too often um, left unloved, uh, untended to. And I think that these, these really pose some challenges uh, for companies like us, and I think uh, for many of the people here on the, on the, uh, on the webinar. Uh, uh, we've had several years of this. This is not new. People are continuously saying the same sorts of things about e-learning. And I fear that there, are, uh, there is a divergence between what people expect in, in their lives and what, uh, and what you're actually providing them with at work in terms of e-learning. So, Again, a rather bold heading, but I think our job as e-learning professionals and learning and development professionals is to really consider some of these questions. You know, how can we use the, the vast array of tools and content resources that are freely, often freely available? How can we bridge the gap between formal and informal learning? How can we deliver more for less? And that's not just more for less money, but uh, making better use of people's time, being more precise about what we're offering. And perhaps most importantly, how do people learn differently now because of the ubiquity of broadband, the, the massive use of uh, social media, uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the ubiquity of, of mobile devices and apps and so on. And I think you know, it's our responsibility to really be thinking hard about how people are learning uh, outside work. Uh, I talked about the vast array of, of content. A lot of that is user-generated. So every minute, I mean, this may not surprise you, uh, these vast numbers, because we hear about them all of the time. But just look at how much data and information is being created every minute. Um, and this is all content that, that, that is free. Um, but how on, earth do you, how on earth do you organize and manage that content and make it useful to you? I've got a, a thought here which I'd like us to share with you, um, represented by this diagram that I'm going to build up. And it really is that um, we've seen over the last few years a, a, a real um, convergence in the way that we learn between work and life. And I think that could be represented by um, something that would, which would have happened 
a decade or more ago, where most training happened in a, in a, in a block of time, perhaps a, a residential course. We then moved increasingly into training that was happening at work, perhaps in shorter spaces uh, of time. When we, when we had started to see the emergence of a good quality CBT, that became uh, an opportunity for people to spend time on their own, at their own time, at their own pace, working through self-paced content. Then with multimedia online learning, we've seen new channels and new media uh, enriching that blend of, of learning. And I think what we, we're seeing is, is, is that that convergence is, is sort of reaching a, um, an inevitable conclusion with, with, a, with a, what we'd like to describe as a mosaic approach. Uh, and what that means really is that we're so, we're so used to um, blending our work and, and life uh, learning it together uh, that actually that, that it's, it's increasingly interwoven so that you know for example you'd be I, I would imagine a lot of people here would, would think nothing of uh, checking something on, on YouTube or Google if, uh, over breakfast in advance of a meeting that they may have that day or when they're at work sharing some information on a social media site within their organization or on the way home on the train they'll, they'll use a five-minute piece of content on, a, on, a, on their mobile device. So it's really very much becoming more and more woven into, into the workplace. And, and we, we, we think that we have to recognize that. We have to respond to those, those, those ever-increasing trends. So I just wonder, perhaps another question to throw out to you, um, which is what, what learning technology trends have brought your Great attention? Question. Uh, and, and perhaps that you're thinking hard about using. Put one eye on it. Uh, on Taylor and Charles Gould. So we've got um, yeah, mobile coming up. Um, and reality. Who? Gamification is coming up uh, here several times. You can see that. Capturing people's imagination at the moment. Social learning. Mobile course moved to HTML5. Yeah. So, lots of lots of different ideas. Quite a lot around mobile, quite a lot, of, lot around social. As perhaps we might Heidi mentioned curation, which we'll come back to. So, yeah, I think um, you know this diagram shows you just the, some of these things that, that we now have uh, as part of our toolkit. And I think that's what we should regard them as. From a variety of different devices, from, from to, to live online training, to the, you know, the plethora of different uh, media file formats that are available, uh, and of course social media as well. Um, sorry, guys, can I hold you off for a second though? Because we we got some comments in the, in the area that we can hear uh, background noise from people. Um, yeah. uh, it's not not everybody can hear it, but some people can. Um, so if you're dialing in. Uh, please do remember to mute. I think um, yeah, I don't think it's, I don't think very many people are doing it, but it's happening with a couple of people. So please, um, yeah, if you're if you're dialing in, it, it should automatically mute, but it doesn't seem to be doing it. So please, uh, just remember to mute yourselves. Okay, guys, uh, Charles and Alex, back to you. Yeah, so I'm, I'm sorry about that. If there is some background noise, but yeah, please could you mute your phones um, to prevent that. Um, what, what we've shown here is, a, is really a, a conceptual model of what we're calling mosaic learning. And um, I'd like to introduce some of these elements to you. In fact, pass over to, to Alex to just talk you through some of these uh, concepts, which are deliberately in response to some of the things that we've been seeing and that you've just mentioned um, around trends in, in uh, learning technologies. Alex, I'll pass it over to you. So yeah, as we've discussed, I mean, there, there are lots of exciting new technologies out there, but uh, we've been doing some thinking about how we can harness the power of those technologies. And, and one application in, in the corporate learning world is, is in the use of um, learning portals, like the example shown here, which aggregates uh, a number of different um, technologies. So here we have uh, featured content which could consist of um, you know, good quality yeah. videos, e-learning courses, and user-generated yeah. content, um, all of which can be rated and reviewed by learners. Um, so you can 
start to see you know, what is the most popular and, and useful content available. We're also looking at using some gamification techniques like leaderboards, which help to encourage some um, friendly competition and celebrate success for people who are doing well, in particular learning games, quizzes, and assessments. Uh, and we also have the opportunity to draw in live online learning, so have a space where people can access all their scheduled uh, webinars and virtual classrooms. And also, as people were discussing earlier, um, bringing in the social elements of learning, so having live Twitter feeds on particular learning campaigns. And of course, quizzes and assessments are still a core part of any learning intervention, so we'd expect to see that in, a, in the portals we're producing. And of course, um, the curation, the cherry picking of really good existing resources, both um, on company intranets and externally on the internet. And here we have our directories of learning, which could be both e-learning and um, access to classroom courses. So it's with you know, drawing together the best uh, blend of online and offline learning. And also the opportunity to post questions to experts within the organization. That just um, to really set the, the feel for the kind of um, the box of tricks we have at our disposal now. And um, Charles will start talking about um, some of the practical application of these in, in some of the real work we've been doing. Yeah, so that's, uh, if you like, a conceptual model uh, which uh, harnesses um, content both designed and curated, social media and gamification, as well as live online social learning. Let's just look at a few examples of this in practice. And one of the, okay. that's one of the first, and we would perhaps argue pioneering example of, of a portal like this, is something that, that we worked with for Sky. This is a... Uh, an onboarding portal for all new joiners who, who join Sky. They, uh, they're able to access this portal. Um, and if we look at it in a little bit more detail, it, com it combines a range of things such as um, interactive games. Uh, oh, we've lost some of the slides there again. Let me just go back. Uh, if I just hover over, this, this image is a little bit uh, fuzzy just because we've uh, We've um, zoomed in or, or zoomed out a bit, so you can see it. We've got a range of different things, such as video assets that Sky can control and, and, uh, and edit and, and manage, some specific modules of e-learning. We have some social media areas down here, games, and a leaderboard as well. Yeah. And this is the, the interesting thing about this is that it's, it's being kept alive and afresh by Sky all of the time. Uh, and that's important because people do think of it as something that's um, dynamic and, and very relevant. Uh, it also has some personal components, so it shows you precisely where you are and what you've got to do. It also has a countdown. I think it's, uh, if I just show you here, a countdown to when, when you're going to join uh, in terms of days, hours, and even minutes before your start date. And you know the results are impressive. Over the last three years, as you can see, there have been significant savings. and. Uh, and people continue to, to, to use this. So that, that encompasses just some of the, 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 the types of things that we've been talking about. More recently, we've worked with Bupa on a similar, similar initiative. And this time, we designed something that has been deployed both on um, computers, PCs, uh, and also iPads. So this has been designed for both using uh, HTML5. And again, it uses a range of different components. Um, so, if I just move through here, Oops. sorry, um, we've got some what we might call essential modules that people really need to, to be able to go through, and then some options to go deeper into uh, extra resources. We've got uh, user-generated content, very simple pieces of video that have been produced at little or no cost. Uh, to, to really give people a, a sense of, of the organization. And then we've spent the, the budget, if you like, uh, really focused that on some high-quality interactive e-learning. We haven't tried to simply repurpose 
uh, a vast amount of information that already exists in a perfectly decent format. Instead, we've, we've really gone about uh, organizing that freely and readily available information and content in a sensible way, and then focusing in on the key messages uh, to put the real sort of design effort into, such as, this, such as in this sort of example here. And uh, in this, this time we focused on the, not, not so much on the business results, but on the, on the, the learners' um, response to, to this, which you can see has been uh, very positive, and, and in particular just the, the level of engagement and relevance that they've, they've found. Let's move on now, and I'll hand over to Alex just to talk through a couple of other examples. Okay, so um, Lloyd's Banking Group came to us because they wanted to convert a 20-day uh, um, face-to-face induction program for their telephony staff into a much shorter and sharper blended learning solution. Uh, and they were looking for an experience that would really motivate their new starters, many of whom are school leavers with uh, little or no understanding of the banking industry. So they wanted something that was you know, very engaging, easy to understand, uh, and not um, your traditional click next to continue uh, kind of e-learning. So for this particular course, um, we took the concept of the learning journey to its logical conclusion. So we take learners on a, a road trip around Lloyd's UK sites. And here you can see Dawn, our virtual trainer in the driving seat, who guides learners through the learning experience. And um, research shows that we tend to process information more deeply uh, when it's presented by a guide character like this, um, which makes a lot of sense as, you know, throughout human history, we tended to learn from other people, whether it's parents, teachers, trainers, or mentors. Now, this program um, comprises over 26 hours of learning. And when you're dealing with that kind of volume of content, it's really important to have a lively and varied mix of media to hold people's attention. So here we have um, you know, presenter-led videos with Dawn, our, our virtual trainer. We also have dramatizations of, of work-based scenarios. So you know, this is really good for, for accelerating people's competence by um, showing them demonstrations of good practice and also things to avoid. Uh, and again, uh, these techniques are based on, on our understanding of the latest research into learning, which shows that people tend to remember um, facts much more easily when they're presented in the context of stories rather than just lists of bullet points. And we also have colleague testimonials. So again, drawing on that kind of YouTube approach to learning where you capture um, best practice from experts within the organization. And of course, um, for Lloyd's telephony staff, um, learning about uh, Lloyd's banking applications is a really critical part of the job. Um, so we used um, a SEMA technology on this one to create uh, system simulations and guided practice. Okay, um, and we'll now move on to uh, some of the very latest work we've done with Heineken, um, uh, which is just going live this week, I believe. So this is really um, hot off the press. And now Heineken, they had a um, really strong business case for um, refreshing and, and revitalizing their uh, training for sales staff, um, as they'd done um, some annual selling skills assessments and found that the failure rates were unacceptably high, higher than the industry standard. Um, so they came to us to, to look at um, how we could make the induction process much more engaging and high impact. So this particular blend um, uses a, a mixture of very traditional and, and very uh, contemporary instructional approaches. So you'll see we have um, um, induction workbooks, which you'd get on your first day of employment. So obviously a very familiar 
Um, but you know, still very effective uh, training and orientation tool. We also have uh, developed for Heineken uh, a physical paper board game, Heineken Experts, which is a kind of uh, trivial pursuit on all things Heineken. Um, and this is great for sales staff who tend to be on the road a lot, on their own, but who get together for monthly uh, meetings and, and briefings to help build up their product and brand knowledge in a really fun and sociable way. Uh, and we also have here um, a capability map um, which outlines learning pathways at Heineken uh, using the 70-20-10 model. And finally, we have another learning portal um, which features a digital version of the board game um, plus lots of really great um, existing resources from within Heineken's intranet and externally, which the Heineken team have cherry-picked for this particular induction learning campaign. So now we'll have a closer look at the portal we've um, developed for Heineken. So here you can see um, you've got access to the online game. Um, we have a leaderboard um, which shows um, the top scoring learners in the game. And Heineken are really going to incentivize usage by awarding monthly prizes for the learners who are, who are doing best in the game. Um, so it adds an extra element of fun to the whole proceedings. And then here we have the learning pathways you can go through to access the wealth of um, existing resources um, that Heineken has. And we also have nice little features like favorites and history so that as you're navigating your way through all this content, you can um, favorite it and also you can rate and review it as you go along so your peers can see what's the most popular content on the site. So we'll just have a look at some of the um, online quiz game. Now you have to use your imagination here as we've only got screenshots today but uh, in the real thing it's all very nicely animated with cards flipping up um, as you select each category and spinning bottles. So you can select questions from all the categories we have here, like selling skills and the brand knowledge. Or you can uh, decide to spin the bottle um, for a random round, which selects 10 questions at random from all categories. So if you did that, um, you have the card flipping up the question. And I, I don't know if we have any cider drinkers on the line today. Does anyone know what colour is the bottle of Bournemouth's original? Yes, those, those of you who answered brown, I believe, are right. Oh dear, oh dear. Too, too many teenage years spent in bus stops, obviously. <laughs> yeah. Let's move on. Um, but if you'd selected clear, uh, you'd have been wrong, I'm afraid. Uh, so, you know, it's a simple multiple choice question quiz, but um, with a bit of added element of fun and tension with um, a, a, a countdown, so you're timed as you're doing it, uh, and you get bonus points if you do it within time, etc. And we'll just skip ahead to see a game feedback screen, which again uses some of those um, gamification techniques a lot of us are familiar with, where you have you know gold stars flashing up on the screen to again add a little bit of uh, fun to the whole learning experience. Now we'll return to the main portal um, and just have a little look at um, the experience of when you go into these learning pathways which are curated by the Heineken team. So if we decided we wanted to um, you know, go a bit deeper about what um, information and training is available on closing and handling objections, we can go into this area. Uh, we can also dive in and, and look at um, you know, what happens in the closing and handling objections workshops. We've got a little outline of the face-to-face -face course and we can directly book ourselves online onto this course. 
that just gives you a, a sort of snapshot of what we've been doing with Heineken in, in terms of a, a blend which mixes old and new, uh, really. Um, just to give you a, a feel for where we're going with that. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Alex. Just picking on up on a, a, a couple of the the questions, um, Alan. The what you're actually looking at is, is the, the front end of of uh, a learning management system, which we uh, which is which is our own learning management system that we license to Heineken. It's hosted uh, externally, which means that uh, they can get access from wherever they can get internet access, provided they have obviously the the correct login details. Um, but I think what's uh, you know perhaps worth re-emphasizing is just the is the is the point which which I think Heidi uh, made I, I, I picked that picked that out earlier which is that of, of curation. Um, if I just get back here, and the the Heineken team are um, all are actively uh, and continuously um, adding to this. Uh, they're adding content. Um, they're they're um, they're, they're recognizing when people have favorited certain a aspects of the learning so that they can focus in on perhaps providing more of that. Uh, so they're, they're responding to the way that users are actually engaging and interacting with this learning portal. Um, and so you can see, for example, I mean, I, it may not come across very clearly, but there are various activities as well as content. Um, there are, uh, going back to their their chosen 70-20-10 model, there are things that people can do uh, on the job. Uh, so while they're working, they, they're expected to undertake experiences that will help them uh, become uh, commercially more aware and able to, to sell Heineken better. Um, and then there are opportunities for people to interact with each other in a more informal way. So um, this really does provide a platform for a lot of the things that we were talking about at the beginning of the presentation. Um, therefore, uh, you know, things like the, the social element, clearly, but not just uh, in terms of uh, the discussion forums, very much being able to interact uh, with, with people informally away from the, from the online forum. And also, of course, to sort of have that element of competition by seeing who can get highest up the leaderboard. Um, did you want to add something there, Alex? Yeah, just uh, picking up on, on some of the technical questions I've, I've noticed in the chat area. Um, it's worth saying that, uh, I mean, this uh, portal and all the portals we've shown so far today are, are, are built using BrightWave's um, launch and track technology. Um, however, these portals um, can be launched from bigger learning management systems with the data um, that's tracked here, passed back to a, to a bigger LMS. Um, so, and it's also worth just uh, saying that this platform is uh, of itself GORM compliant, so all the data is, is captured uh, to that standard. So, I think we'll just try and sort of draw these threads back together again. Um, uh, so, we've, we've obviously looked at some of the the trends that are influencing our thinking, uh, some of the things which increasingly we can't avoid or escape uh, that are happening in our, our recreational lives that are, are then being brought to work, so mobile and, and social. Um, and then we've looked at some specific examples that highlight some of those things, culminating in, in Heineken's very much uh, uh, curated content approach. So, I'd like to really just sort of draw those together and consider again uh, what, what might the future of online learning look like? Um, well, we certainly think that uh, it should incorporate dynamic and user-generated content. So rather than a course being created in a, in a vacuum and then launched and never touched, um, becoming in, in increasingly irrelevant over time, we should really be looking to have uh, that use, use the technology, use the social media and online technology better to make sure that the learning is, is, is kept alive. Um, and we should be recognizing the demand for webinar and virtual classroom-based training. Uh, so 
offering people that live experience that we're, we, we've got right now, where people can interact with the facilitator, but also peers uh, that, that can be done live and then taken offline uh, later on as well. We talked a little bit about gamification, um, as well as storytelling, uh, competition and gaming are very powerful ways of engaging, uh, not just engaging people, but helping them focus in on uh, problem solving, which uh, is, is, is a, a wonderful way of um, really engaging the brain and, and being able to help people learn uh, to keep key things and key elements that will help, help them solve problems. And then, uh, yeah, as we said, how do you draw together uh, in a relevant way for your audience of, of learners, content that, that really is going to help them. How do you cut through the noise? How do you uh, make the most of what's freely available? Um, we, we, we happen to believe that, that one of the key skills that is emerging uh, is that of, of being able to research properly. Um, but it's something that I can see from my own children as, as they try and struggle with their homework. It's not an easy thing to do. And the temptation is simply to uh, focus in on, the, on the, the top two or three links of a Google search, which isn't always the best for content and relevance. So there's a real uh, opportunity to grapple with this issue of content curation, making freely available content relevant. And that could be both externally on the internet at large, but of course also within your own organization there's bound to be um, a lot of very valuable knowledge and, and content that can be uh, curated and made, made available and relevant to for a particular subject and a particular group of people. But of course, with that content comes the need to be able to guide people through it and navigate. So one thing curating and, and gathering relevant content is another then to help people really see where they should be going with that. So with Heineken, we looked at the, the route map uh, based on the sort of London Underground um, idea and you know that's a, that's a good example of really providing people with lots of content and resources but then helping them uh, to direct their learning talked about social learning we've also talked about the importance of focusing in on the, the real high impact content where the messages are really important that everyone needs to be aware of so that might be some you know nice nicely produced video dramas it could be uh, some, some high-impact animations and very interactive e-learning. So there's still a place for well-designed, perhaps what we might consider to be more conventional e-learning here. But it's not a case of simply repurposing vast amounts of uh, you know, PowerPoint slides and, and trying to sort of uh, make those go online and, and without really adding a lot to them. And we, we actually think that all this um, ought to be focused in on the real performance objectives that you have when you're working with your, your, your learners. Um, you know, it's all very well providing people with lots of resources, the ability to interact with, with, with one another, games and stories, but of course there has to be a, a, a real business purpose if we're going to invest time and money into, into these things. So why not really make the the, the assessment, if you like, and it may be that we don't use that particular word, but the, the proof that you really have got a capability built. Why don't you make that the, the real focus? Uh, in a way, don't worry about how people have got there, uh, but ensure that they, that they have actually made it there. And um, so, we, we, you know, I'm sure we've all seen the sort of rather tokenistic uh, 10 multiple choice questions at the end of, a, of an e-learning course. That, that frankly have been uh, fairly rushed together and, and are easy to easy to answer. Well, that really adds nothing in my view. I think we really need to to use assessments to to, to focus people's um, performance and and focus in on the change that we want people to to be able to demonstrate. And then finally, something that we're increasingly uh, interested in is what we call the learning analytics. Sounds a rather technical thing. But it's, it, what, is, what this actually is, is about making more of the data that is captured through learning management systems about how people are using learning and how they're interacting with one another and with content. 
Um, so, for example, we may have found recently that with one client we were uh, able to see that um, 2,000 people had registered on an online portal, and uh, but only 52% had, had actually accessed the content. But of those people, uh, something like 80% had worked their way through and completed a, a tough assessment. So what does that tell us? Well, it, it tells us that there's an issue about encouraging people to to, to actually uh, be motivated to go to the, to, the, to, the, to the learning. But once they're there, the, the content and the experience has been effective. Um, another example could be that we find uh, a percentage of people that have uh, struggled technically to access uh, the portal. And so there are various things that, that can be um, used to improve the learning experience. And in the case of people like Heineken, you know, they're actively responding to an analysis of their, uh, their audience and how they're interacting with the, with the learning portal. And so it's really about making more of the, the data that is becoming more and more available in terms of how people use these learning experiences uh, and providing some analysis of that. So there's no shortage, as we know, of, of data about how many people have gone through a test, how many people have completed a course, and so on. But what do you do with that, and how, how do you then use that to improve the whole experience? So finally, I'd like to uh, you know, just sort of consider what that really will mean in terms of the benefits. Uh, for, for uh, e-learning and, and online learning in the future. Quite, quite a few simple things, really. I think that um, we're going to see a, a more focus on, on performance and change through that sort of real uh, focus on, on uh, assessment and less time wasted for learners who already can do things. More use of what's already available and less spent on repurposing content. And more precision. I think that's a key thing and less noise and irrelevance. Now, that's a real challenge, of course, when we look at that vast amount of content. And that's where, again, I think the, the, the issue of curation, navigation through uh, uh, content and resources, and focusing in on a real objective that the learner needs to achieve through perhaps an assessment. Those are, those are the things that really matter. So. Um, I'd like to just sort of now, perhaps with Don's help, pick up on some of the, the, the questions and, 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 and comments that we've seen um, and just sort of get people's views about some of the things that we've shown. Um, wow. Let's have a look through. Charles, great job. Um, don't worry about <laughs> going through them yourself. I tell you, I've been struggling a bit to surf through the questions here and keep up with them. Some super questions, answers, observations, thoughts, discussions. Um, well, Heidi Ball says, historically, qualifications are very new. What did Roman aqueduct builders do to have a 2,000-plus year legacy? The answer is, of course, they had apprenticeships. But, of course, apprenticeships uh, did have a, not a qualification structure, but a very formal structure of indenture, uh, a fixed time. And at the end of it, you did have your articles, which you only got if the master thought that you were up to scratch. So I guess you could say that was a qualification. That's by the by. I think uh, we can talk about uh, qualifications as being uh, uh, accurate uh, as a measure of competence uh, until the cows come home. But let's come back to some of the questions we had, Charles, and we did have an yeah. awful lot. Um, uh, I'm just picking out one that, that, that David on. Cole has, has raised, which is um, about uh, the, the, the question, is, it, is, it, is unstructured? Well, that's a big one. James Farrow came up with this. Is, 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 it, is, is there a danger it could be unstructured? Viv, Mark, Hyde, you all pitched in with, with, with different opinions. It's an interesting discussion. Uh, can it be too unstructured? Is that necessarily a bad thing? Charles? Well, yeah, I mean, that, that's a really interesting question. I think there are a few ways to answer that. I mean, one is that people are used to unstructured. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're increasingly used to multiple ways of interacting with content and with, the people on, you know, with other people online with knowledge and information. But I think that there is a risk of um, assuming that people can find their own pathways through efficiently. So, you know, there is, a, there is a, as I said about my children doing their homework, you can spend an awful lot of time trying to research and not necessarily coming up with the best answers. Mm. So that's where the, 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 that, that issue of curation and navigation comes in. So there is a role for someone to play, in my view, to help and assist people through um, some, you know, really good, valuable, and dynamic information and content. So, um, yeah, I think what you know, Viv's, Viv's 
question is a good one, and, and, and the other people have, have chipped in there. And a lot of it is around the context. If you've got a sophisticated audience who are used to being able to, to who've got good research skills, then perhaps some lack of structure is is, uh, is a good thing. But in our view, that you can you can get a good balance by by using curation and navigation and assessment. Just just I think what, the assessment, just the assessments is is really important because if you are giving people a, a more kind of open-ended uh, way of accessing learning, you want to be sure they have understood the key points, and that's why not just having um, very simple multiple choice questions at ends, which are, are, are too, uh, you know traditionally have been too easy to cheat your way through and actually looking at um, spending time and effort in developing you know real really challenging job simulations which really test understanding and application of knowledge is really important and a, 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 an increasingly important part of this kind of blend. Yeah, and I can see this conversation carrying on Mark Novis and, 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 and Steve Goodwin talking about the, the, the structure issue. I, I think there's also a, a point to be made about the going back to the purpose. If we're talking about um, some very serious compliance procedures and policies, then arguably there is only one right way to do something, and therefore um, a highly structured approach and possibly a linear approach is, is called for. Whereas actually if, if you're talking about um, slightly less uh, specific or, or, or mandatory performance, then yeah, I think people should be enabled to find their own path <coughs> to uh, learning so that it actually works for them and isn't isn't irrelevant and is making efficient use of their own time. So people you know people people don't want to be pushed through screen after screen of information that they are either engaging or irrelevant because they already know it. So uh, you know I think it's horses for courses really. And it's also about um, the level of learning uh, learners understanding. So for novice learners actually very structured approaches are, are quite appropriate because if you're in a position you know you don't know what you don't know, it, it, it's quite good to be handheld through the content, but for more um, sophisticated, experienced learners of a subject, you, you might want to give them more opportunities to um, you know, define their own learning pathways. Yeah, and um, JP is making the, a, a similar point to, to the one that I made about compliance training, where it is heavily regulated. Yeah, it probably needs to be more more structured. Okay, uh, let's, th there are plenty more questions. I mean, the, the structure question is an important one, but let's let's not. Let's go back to some others then. Yeah, I've got I've got plenty more to, to pull out. But what I do is as, as it goes on, I, I pull out questions, and yeah. and and this prevents people who ask questions early on being forgotten. Like yeah. Luke, on the Heineken question, a number of people came up with the same question in different ways asked, how did you structure the 70 in the 70 20, 10 model? Always a key question, isn't it? So yeah. what did you do there? Well, this is very much um, the Heineken team identifying things that their, their team can be doing on the job and at work that will uh, help their performance. Bear in mind that this was designed mainly for with new, fairly new joiners in mind, um, where a combination anyway of uh, learning on, on the job uh, interact. So it's a bit of background noise there, guys. I don't know what it is. You, you'll yeah, have to say that again, Charles. Go on. Not that. Um, yeah. yeah. So, so it really reflects how they uh, upskill their their team anyway, yep. um, in, in, and have done for for, for you know for some time, uh, and then really try to organise organise that through the through the portal. So if we had more time to show you, though, we, we could show you that there are quite a lot of links or um, resources that, that help people learn on the job as well as uh, things that they can take more formally. Uh, but it was really, you know, we acted as the, as the enablers for Heineken to, to build that 70-20-10 model, which is one that they chose, incidentally. I think, um, you know, there are, there are, there's a whole interesting debate about the validity of that 70-20-10 model, but we, we were certainly happy to work with Heineken on uh, okay, just, ju just a quick recap on 70-20-10 for people, that uh, it is a description rather than a uh, rule, just, yeah. just to be clear. Um, there's a lot of flack flying around about 70-20-10 saying that you have to have 70% of this, 20% of this, and 10% of formal, and it's not the case. So um, 
let's move on. Um, let's talk about gamification. Um, Phil raised the point about gamification and serious games. Gamification means adding a little bit of game, gaming stuff on top, and, and serious gaming means starting it from the beginning with uh, games in mind. Uh, I, I'm taking it that here you mentioned adding gaming elements. You're really talking about gamification rather than starting with, with a game in mind. Is, is that true? I think we do, we've done a mixture of the two. I mean, gamification, um, as, as the participants have rightly noted, is about just taking uh, little elements of games like leaderboards, like some of those um, competitive and engaging elements and incorporating them in, in other applications like e-learning or, or other kinds of websites and, and systems. And, and, and you're right, they aren't the same as serious games where you have you know, very immersive environments um, which are you know, fully structured games. But like a virtual call center, yeah. for example. Yeah. So virtual call center. But uh, I guess yeah. the, the advantage of, of gamification is you can um, use some of those um, engagement approaches quite cost effectively um, uh, in a way that really does grab people's attention. But mm. yes, you're right, and it's not the same as a, a full serious game. Okay. Uh, going back then to, uh, to some other questions that came up, um, uh, Chris Lewis Cooper sort of drew on this idea of gamification and said, how do we make, and I'd, I'd like to go on to user generated content after this, there was a bit of discussion about that, uh, but uh, firstly, how do we make gamified content dynamic and user generated? Because if you're, if you're using a game, then you're defining in the beginning what the structure is and much of the content. So how do you bridge the gap between a game and the idea of uh, user generated content and, and making it uh, less structured? Or have I got, is there no paradox there at all? I think it, it, here we, we were seeing them as these are all different elements that we could draw on, and um, you know, some of them are quite separate. So yeah, you're right. With, with a, a game, it does take a lot of um, thinking through all, all the elements of the game, and it is a very quite structured learning experience. Um, and user-generated content is another part of, of the power of, of technologies we, we have available. I guess what we're seeing um, in this mix of the kind of do-it-yourself, user-generated content, the curation of existing resources online, is what that gives you an opportunity for is to look at where you want to concentrate your budget. So rather than um, spending money in developing huge courses which are regurgitating yeah. content that's already out there or can be supplied by your community for free, you're probably best off thinking uh, about you know, mm. spending your money on quality rather than quantity. And that might be looking at, well, let's have some Is gamified right? learning approaches or some really yeah. tough job, job simulations and assessments. Yeah, we've got, so we've got another background voice. I don't know where they're coming from. Please, if you're, if you're dialing in, please do put yourselves on mute. Um, uh, taking, so thanks for that answer, Alex. Moving on to this, this idea then of, um, of the involvement of people with, with generating content. So I'm trying to, as you can tell, crack through some, some yeah. questions we've got. Uh, I think it was Jason just raised a point. He says, um, no, Jonathan Vernon, in relation to user-generated content, whilst valuable and laudable, I question how many or what percentage of a population can or want to contribute and to what degree they do do? Uh, is it an art to extract or generate user-generated content? So there's a question of how we can get user-generated content in the first place. And also we had a question raised by Stephen and Sheila as to what exactly the boundaries are. Without being too semantic, where does user-generated content and working with an uh, end and working with an SME begin? Do you have any thoughts about that in general in terms of this, because obviously if you've got a mosaic approach, uh, I'm guessing a lot of the stuff you're working with will be UGC. A any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, just to sort of tackle the first point, that, um, yeah, that obviously there is always a, a, a percentage of people who um, are willing to share their thoughts and, and, and put those thoughts into, into content in whatever that form may take. But we're all very now becoming very used to things like... Uh, rating of uh, you know videos on YouTube or if we go to TripAdvisor we can we can sort of filter through to the most popular 
content or most popular comments. And I don't see why that shouldn't be any different for, um, uh, for, for learning content that we use at work. So, if we, so again, looking at the Heineken example, there was an opportunity to like particular um, elements. And, uh, and, and, and perhaps we could focus that a little bit more into how useful was that to you. And we, we, again, we see this in all sorts of other uh, media. So, so that, that, that certainly, um, uh, you know, I, think there, I don't think we should shy away from, from uh, enabling people to share their, their views and their content. Uh, and if you have ways of then uh, ensuring that the, the cream rises to the top, then I think that's, that's all, all the better. As Cheryl says, critical thinking needs to be applied on UGC, user-generated content, uh, as production as well as consumption. User ratings help, of course. I, uh, and I think that's a really good point. Uh, by the way, Mike Towns is saying, Mark and Novis, it would be great to connect. What's your email address? You can by all means share it here if you want to. Or if you prefer, you could probably do it through the Learning and Skills Group where you don't have to share it with everybody else. And yes, we've got Sally and a bunch of other people saying, too much background noise, we need Mutual. Well, we, we have got Mutual on. I, I don't quite understand why this is happening. Um, anyway, um, let's move on. With the, well, we have probably time for one more question. So let me, let me find uh, the one more question. I'm sorry, I did say to a lot of people, yes, I'll raise that excellent point at the end. And yes, we've run out of time. We tend to on these because we've got smart people. They come up with good questions. Uh, there's a question I'd like to ask about video and cost, because we had two different sides of this. Um, we had one point, which is that video is expensive, and it's going to be difficult. Even No matter how good drama might be, it can be just expensive, Jonathan said, to produce quality video. But Anne, Alan said, I think technology allows us to make video quicker and more real than ever. So uh, who's right, or are they both right in some way? Charles, I know you used a lot of video, and that's why I'm, that's why I'm quite keen on getting this question answered. Yeah, I mean, I, we'd, we'd look at, at uh, this as a spectrum, from, and, it, and it's all relevant, it's all, it's all valid. So, yeah, some video can be free, can't it? A lot of video can be produced at little or no cost, and it's useful and relevant. So that might be some talking heads, some sort of some very simple YouTube-style how-to guides. But equally, uh, there's a place for really well-honed, well-designed video, especially when we're talking about... Um, drama. Uh, so in the Lloyd's uh, example, we, we, you know, there, was a, there was a serious budget for, for very good quality video. Mm. Um, but yeah, it, I think it's people sometimes um, automatically assume that video is, mm. is a, more cost, uh, a more costly option, but it doesn't always have to be. I mean, recently we've done some work uh, with a client where we recorded their um, subject expert talking through some PowerPoint slides and brought this to life by animating some of the slides and his text mm -hmm. in, um, in sync with, with his narration. Mm -hmm. And so we did a one-day shoot and then um, a, a couple of days edit. So we had 30 minutes of really good quality video um, produced you know, very cost-effectively. I mean, I mean, certainly cheaper than an equivalent 30 minutes of, of e-learning, say, and in terms of the production time to mm. shoot and edit video, it does tend to be quite a lot quicker than, um, say, a, a flash-based or mm. HTML5-based e-learning course. And, and as we've seen from YouTube, I mean, the appetite people have for watching videos is, is incredible. And now that, um, fortunately, in... in in many, I, I appreciate not all corporate environments, you know, bandwidth is growing or, or you're able to host some of your learning content externally, then I think the opportunities for, for video-based learning are, are going to grow and grow. I think Alan Brown just made a good point, which is, yeah, I mean, you, you want to, to work out how, how quickly and, and often you want to change. And if you, if you put stuff into expensive video, that might be an issue. But it's really what you do with that video, isn't it? I mean, you can make yeah. it very inter you can make it interactive. You can you can break it into small pieces. And, and Jonathan Vernon, um, who clearly knows what he's talking about, says says cost is now down to the craft skills of writers and directors. And yeah. Andrew Hyde raises a very good point. Good video is expensive. <laughs> Sometimes so is bad video because after all, all you've done is thrown away your money on a lot of tat. Yeah. Um, okay, just sorry, I said that was the last question. I have a rider question because I did say I was going to ask this, and it was an important point to my unfortunately let it get lost, but Robin brought it up again, accessibility. It, this is not exclusive to what you've been talking about here today, but it is an important issue. 
uh, can this sort of visually rich approach really work for people who are on, for example, screen lead readers or who are visually impaired? Uh, and uh, by the way, in the background, I should say, I'm also working myself towards ways of making our forums here accessible, accessible for people who especially have hearing difficulties. But there's our last question, Charles, screen reading, screen reading and visually rich material, what can we do? I mean, I think we're, we're firm believers that wherever possible, you shouldn't take a, a one-size-fits-all approach. You, you want to create the best learning experience you can for, for particular groups. Um, so I think rather than um, compromising on some of the uh, visual richness, which are going to be very important to some users, uh, in an ideal world, you want to, to optimize the learning experience for, for different types of users and, and personalize the learning experience. And you see that now across websites. You can personalize the site to your requirements and preferences. And, and where um, budget allows, we, we would prefer to, to recommend that for e-learning experiences as well. So you can have a very visually rich course, but also have an accessible version go with it. But sometimes, of course, budgets don't allow that, and so you have to look at making some compromises on, on both sides to, to get a solution that, that is usable by everyone. But usually, there's no real excuse for not making uh, you know, the bulk of text screen readable and, and for tagging images and things like that. And we would certainly do that in most cases. Very good. I've, we are over the hour already, which is terrible. I'd never do that. But, um, but we, we have to wrap up, unfortunately. I do apologize, because as always, with uh, 160 people in the room, as we, we had at the peak, um, we have a tremendous amount of, um, of comments and really useful stuff. And it, it always kills me to have to wrap it up. But people have places to go, work to do, uh, presentations to write, I guess, and, and all that. Um, let's just quickly go through to the um, to the contact details for, for Brightwave. There we are. So if you want to contact the Brightwave guys, uh, that's the details. And of course, this presentation will be recorded and uh, will be available uh, online uh, afterwards at the Learning and Skills Group. And let me just quickly show you how that all works. So I have to go back to um, my wrap-up slides. So. Um, Thank you, everyone, I must say, for your, for your participation as well, chipping in. And also, I have to say a big thank you to Charles and Alex for everything they've brought to the situation. The hashtag for the event is hash LSG webinar. And if you've enjoyed that, please do uh, let the world know about it on Twitter. As I say, the uh, details, the materials are all available through the Learning and Skills Group. And that's the URL there. Unsurprisingly, it is at thelearningandskillsgroup.com. And it's free to sign up. Just put your name in, and you're registered, and off you go. And oh, our next uh, webinar. Goodness me, it's in 55 minutes UK time. Ed Cohen, who despite the photograph, is not a silent movie tap dancer, but is in fact a very smart guy working in the field of e-learning. He's going to be talking about the value of high quality learning content. And that, I think, draws on quite nicely from UGC and everything we were talking about just now. Uh, we'll, we'll hear from Ed and his amazing tap dancing shoes uh, at 12 o'clock UK time. That's in about 55 minutes. Once again, thanks, everyone, on the call for your participation, your thoughts. And thanks to Charles and Alex. As you can see, great uh, plaudits here coming through to you for a great presentation. Thanks, guys.